Good morning and welcome to St. John's McGuanago's Morning Praise. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Hasten to save me, O God. O Lord, come quickly to help me. The Lord is risen. Let us worship him. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. The deep places of the earth are in his hand. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hand formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Alleluia. A reading from Acts chapter 9, Saul's conversion. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. The word of the Lord. This is a familiar account of St. Paul's conversion. And there's a couple of things that we'd like to highlight, even though there are so many things here that we'll have to ignore because it's such a wonderful text. There's a couple of things that really jump out to me. One is the obvious idea of being blind and seeing again, that we are blind in sin, but now that we see the enlightenment that God has given us, we are now able to see both law and gospel. This is what the Holy Spirit does. Like a light switch that goes on in the dark, we are blinded at first, but then we see. We see our sin, but we also see our Savior. We see the law, and we see the gospel. And Saul, who was an enemy of God, who was actually trying to hunt down followers of Christ to have them executed, presumably, um, he is struck blind. He sees that he has persecuted Jesus, the law, but then he is given baptism and he is given grace by the very people that he wanted to persecute, he sees the gospel. And isn't that something else? That way God uses people. I mean, Saul is the last person you would think God would use because he was an enemy of Christ and he has a bad authority. Now, there are some things Paul has going for him. Of course, he is a Roman citizen. That's going to play an important part later in the story where he is able to have a certain amount of due process. When he is arrested for teaching the faith, he can appeal all the way to the the Romans. He is actually a very highly respected member of the Jewish community. He went to a very good school. I like to say that he went to the Harvard of Judaism. And yet at the same time, why would God use him who has so much baggage? Well, isn't that how God operates, that he would use sinners like you and me? 
God doesn't just save, he uses people. But then when Saul is going to be brought into the faith and he's going to be baptized, when he is going to have this conversion, not just on the road to Damascus, but, but also the continuation of that when he is baptized by Ananias, he has shown love to the very people that he was trying to hunt down. In fact, Ananias needs to be convinced by God to, to actually baptize and actually to be kind and to show the gospel to Saul, later known as Paul. What a beautiful thing. In a nutshell, that is the gospel and how God uses us sinners. But there's one thing else that I'd like to point out, and that is when Jesus confronts Saul, he asks him, not why do you persecute my people, but why do you persecute me? And isn't that something? That he doesn't say my people, but me. We are the body of Christ. We suffer with Christ. We are baptized, baptized into Christ. We are resurrected with Christ. We're so one with Christ because of the blood that he shed on the cross, reconciling us to the Father. That it's sometimes even hard to distinguish. Oh, we don't become God. I'm not saying that. But we are intimately involved in Christ, and Christ is intimately involved in our lives as we wear him, as he wears us as a mask in our vocations, that our lives die to him and that we are resurrected through him. And so when Saul was persecuting the followers of the way, he was attacking the body of Christ. He was attacking Christ. And that's why Jesus comes and says, why do you persecute me? And what a devastating lesson of law that was. And it's a devastating lesson of law to us. When we sin against God's people, people are hurt, but we also sin against God. As David said when he finally repented of his sin with Bathsheba, it's sin against the Lord too. But it's always about sinning against the people. And the people are, in the case of the Christian church, the body of Christ. And so in this case, they are one and the same. But we are also saved through the church. Ananias baptizes Saul, and we are saved by Christ through the church. It's a very intimate relationship we have with God. And no more an intimate relationship than anybody had with Jesus Christ than perhaps Paul. Paul is converted specifically by Jesus Christ. He has given commands by Jesus Christ. He is used by Jesus Christ. All of this after persecuting Jesus Christ. And he spends time in Arabia, his post-grad work with Jesus. He is intimately involved with Christ. No wonder then it is Paul later who talks about baptism as such an intimate death and resurrection. Isn't it something that Paul talks about us in the way that is so intimate when it comes to our relationship with Jesus Christ throughout his epistles. I don't think Paul obviously ever forgot this conversion. And I think that it was with him every day of his life. And your conversion, even if you don't remember it at baptism, is an intimate relationship with Jesus and it should be a part of your everyday life. Your conversion, maybe not as dramatic as on Paul's on his way to Damascus, but it was just as important. And in fact, it was just as dramatic, certainly from the viewpoint of God and the angels who saw somebody in the class of the devil now being released and given freedom, being intimate with your Lord Jesus. The Te Deum. We praise you, O God. We acclaim you as Lord. All creation worships you, Father everlasting. To you, all angels, all the powers of heaven, cherubim and seraphim sing in endless praise. Holy, 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 Lord God of heavenly hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. The glorious company of apostles praise you. The noble fellowship of prophets praise you. The white-robed army of martyrs praise you. Throughout the world, the holy church acclaims you. Father of majesty, unbounded, your glorious, true and only Son, and the Holy Spirit, advocate and guide. You, Christ, are the King of glory, the eternal Son of the Father. When you became man to set us free, you humbled yourself to be born of a virgin. You overcame the sting of death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You sit at the right hand in the glory of the Father. We believe that you will come to be our judge. 
Come then, Lord, and help your people, bought with the price of your own blood, and bring us with your saints to glory everlasting. In the morning, O Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And we also pray. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.